Peter Navarro, a White House advisor to former President Donald Trump, was convicted of contempt of Congress on Thursday for refusing lawmakers' subpoenas related to a probe into the January 6, 2021, attack on the U.S. Capitol. Navarro refused to testify or turn over documents to the Democratic-led House panel that investigated the riot by Trump supporters, claiming these were shielded by the president's executive privilege. A judge disagreed, and a jury found Navarro guilty of two counts of contempt. Speaking to reporters after the verdict, Navarro vowed to appeal. You're going in what the verdict was going to be. That's why this is going to the appeals court. I am willing to go to prison to settle this issue. I'm willing to do that. But I also know that the likelihood of me going to prison is relatively small because we are right on this issue. The verdict in Navarro's case in federal court in Washington came after a trial that featured just one day of testimony from three prosecution witnesses. The defense did not call any witnesses or present any evidence. A federal prosecutor had told jurors, quote, the defendant chose allegiance to former President Trump over compliance with the subpoena. That is contempt. That is a crime. The charges carry a minimum of 30 days and a maximum of one year in jail. A sentencing hearing is scheduled for January 12th. U.S. President Joe Biden is bringing an ambitious message to this weekend's G20 Leader Summit in India. His offer for the Global South is this. Whatever happens to China's economy, the United States can help fund your development. Biden is hoping to persuade fast-growing economies in Africa, Latin America and Asia that there is an alternative to China's massive infrastructure plan called the Belt and Road Project, which has funneled billions of dollars to developing countries, but left many deeply in debt. Part of that pitch involves reforming the World Bank and boosting its funding under President Ajay Banga for infrastructure in the developing world. Washington thinks a rebooted World Bank could meet the Global South's needs and serve its own interests. Here's how U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan described Washington's focus to reporters on Tuesday. We know that these institutions are some of the most effective tools that we have for mobilizing transparent, high-quality investment into developing countries. And that's why the United States has championed the major effort that is currently underway to evolve these institutions so that they are up to the challenges of today and tomorrow. Sullivan acknowledged China is a shareholder in the World Bank and said that World Bank reform is not about Beijing. But in a letter to congressional lawmakers last month, the White House said it was, quote, essential that we offer a credible alternative to the People's Republic of China's coercive and unsustainable lending and infrastructure projects for developing countries around the world. Biden will have at least one advantage this weekend. Chinese President Xi Jinping will not be at the G20 meetings. Chinese Premier Li Xiang will represent China. His country has lent hundreds of billions of dollars as part of their project, which envisioned Chinese institutions financing the bulk of the infrastructure in mainly developing nations. Yet, the credit has dried up in recent years, and many countries are struggling to repay their debts as interest rates rise. Flood survivors were airlifted from their submerged homes on Thursday as deadly storm Daniel continued to pound central Greece for a third day. The storm has already claimed several lives, while more people remain missing. Heavy rainfall has triggered landslides, destroyed buildings, and carried away dozens of cars. Aerial footage showed roads completely washed out by muddy water and bridges wiped out by swollen rivers. We have never experienced anything like this before in all these years, says this woman, adding, the water was too much. Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis postponed an annual economic speech scheduled for this weekend. He is planning a visit to the affected areas in the coming days. 
It all comes just days after a two-week deadly wildfire died out in the north, one described by authorities as the most extreme on record. Hannah Cloak is a professor at Reading University. We've got climate change right here in our hands. We can see it in these hot temperatures that we've been experiencing. Uh, we've seen heat waves, but also marine heat waves. So the, the ocean has been very, very warm. And of course, all the extremes that come along with that and uh, more energy in the system. So devastating wildfires, uh, intense rainfall as well. Since Tuesday, more than 800 people have been evacuated across the country most of them in the Thessaly region. Rescue workers are now searching for those who stayed behind. They can't do anything revolutionary, but my goodness me, they could do some pretty important things. They can take more risks, but also and they can, they can be willing to, if you like, have a slightly different place in the capital stack, they can be much more creative with, with organizations like us. I mean, one of the things we were discussing in, in, uh, in, in Nairobi is the opportunity to take philanthropic money and put it in as um, it to de-risk, put it in as junior equity, for example, um, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, designing and preparing projects, because the, the sort of the, the common story is, if you're an investor, I'd love to put money if there were some good projects to put money in. And, and you get into this, and, and then how do you get the good projects? Well, actually, there's not the risk money that goes in, because in Africa, you know, maybe 40% of the projects that you design will never actually come to financial closure, so they're not willing to take that, that risk. So maybe then we could come in and do that kind of thing. There's been a lot of work, uh, for example, with grant funding for that. For example, PIDGE, which is a, a British financed uh, a project preparation facility, is very, very good. But it can't scale. So what we're trying to figure out is, is there a way where we could partner with private investors in that project preparation? We have decided that both for security reasons and for um, perhaps maybe in the prestige of the country, uh, they along the route in the very G20 sensitive areas, uh, they do not want the street dogs to uh, to be around for some time for these four days of G20. After the G20 summit, we were given a target till September 10th. After September 11th or 12th, we will release them to where they were caught. The U.S. envoy to the United Nations has said the United States will do everything in our power to prevent and respond to mass atrocities during Sudan's war. Linda Thomas-Greenfield made that comment in a Chad border town on Wednesday as she met with Sudanese refugees who had fled ethnic and sexual violence. I have to tell you that I was really shaken to my core by some of the horrors that Sudanese people have endured. Okay. War broke out in Sudan in April. Tensions between the army and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, who jointly staged a coup in 2021, erupted into fighting over a planned transition to civilian rule. In Ardre, Thomas Greenfield announced high-profile sanctions, including against the deputy leader of the RSF, Abdul Rahim Hamdan Dagalo, for human rights abuses. He is also the brother of the RSF commander Mohammed Handan Dagalo and on Thursday described the sanctions as unfair. Thomas Greenfield compared the current situation with the atrocities committed in Sudan's Darfur region in the early 2000s, describing reports of women being repeatedly gang-raped and aerial photographs of mass graves.
The UN estimates some 300,000 people were killed in Darfur when so-called Janjaweed militias helped the army crush a rebellion by mainly non-Arab groups. The RSF was later formed out of the Janjaweed. Fast forward two decades and the UN says some 380,000 refugees have fled to Chad, with hundreds of thousands more escaping to Central African Republic, Egypt, Ethiopia and South Sudan. During her visit, Thomas Greenfield visited a Médecins Sans Frontières hospital where patients were mostly being treated for malnutrition. It is heartbreaking to watch children suffer because of senseless conflict. And we must do everything possible to save lives, to save their lives before it's too late. Half of Sudan's 49 million people need help, the UN says, and it has appealed for 2.6 billion US dollars. So far, it has secured just 26% of the amount. Thomas Greenfield described that as shameful and urged the international community to do more and give more. Отставить тревогу. Идите спите. По-любому не ракета. Hong Kong was hit with record-breaking rainfall Thursday and into Friday, its heaviest in over a century of records. Parts of the Asian financial hub became a chaotic deluge with some areas recording nearly eight inches of rain. Streets turned into rushing streams, leaving some to wade waist-deep in murky water. Metro stations became swamps. The city's rail operator, MTR, partially shut one line, while others were operating with delays. Business districts in the densely packed city of over seven million remained flooded on Friday morning. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange remained shut for the day, while schools and offices were closed. The downpour also triggered landslides in some areas of the city. The torrential rain was brought by Typhoon Haikui, which made landfall in the Chinese province of Fujian on Tuesday. Although it had weakened, a huge amount of water was still dumped on areas still soaked by another super typhoon last week. The city's leader, John Lee, said in a statement he was very concerned about the severe flooding in most parts of the territory. He instructed all departments to respond with, quote, all-out efforts. The neighboring Chinese city of Shenzhen was also hit by floods caused by heavy rain. State TV showed residents evacuated from waist-high waters. State media said tens of thousands of people were evacuated from cities of Meizhou and Jieyang, and authorities warn people to expect heavy rain for the next three days in the regions of Guangdong and Guangxi. I would push back on the assertion from um, Russian officials. Here, the CDC has stated that there is no evidence that the uh, depleted uranium rounds, rounds cause cancer. The World Health Organization reports that there has been no increase of leukemia or other cancers um, and that have been established following any exposure to uranium or DU. These are standard issue rounds. These are what um, these Abrams tanks will use. And um, many militaries across the world use depleted uranium in their tanks. So we feel that these will be the most effective um, rounds to counter <coughs> Russian tanks and will help um, continue, will help the Ukrainians to defend their the battlefield, uh, to defend their territory. Welcome in Belgium! <laughs> Stop the pollution of the fucking place! Well done. Oh, sorry, shoot me. One water was destroyed. No, 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 we can't. 
press conference and an after this now and then. But first we're going to submit the petition to Mr. Ms. von der Leyen. And what do you think about the, the gesture no? What do we think about the, here's our petition. No, the, the, the no, 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 no. We're here to discuss the petition. I love cream cakes. They're my favorite. Okay, so we're here this morning to submit uh, our latest passenger petition to our close friend, Miss Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, the petition, we submitted the first petition about uh, six months ago when we had only one million signatories. We now have uh, 1.5 million signatories have now signed our petition. Uh, calling on Ursula von der Leyen and the European Commission to take action uh, to protect overflights during strikes. This is a delicious cake. Ryan Salem is the latest executive of the now bankrupt cryptocurrency platform FTX to plead guilty ahead of a trial of its founder, Sam Bankman Fried. On Thursday, Salem admitted to criminal charges of campaign finance law in making tens of millions of dollars of unlawful donations to boost causes supported by his boss, Bankman Freed. Prosecutors say Salem, Bankman Freed, and former FTX engineering chief Nishad Singh used the company's customer funds to donate to political candidates supporting crypto friendly legislation. They also say Salem told a confidant that Bankman Freed hoped political donations would, quote, weed out anti crypto Democratic and Republican lawmakers, meaning defeat them in elections. Salem gave more than $24 million to Republican candidates and causes in the 2022 election cycle, according to Federal Election Commission data, making him a top donor that year. He said in court that the money he used was recorded as loans from FTX's sister company the hedge fund Alameda Research, but he did not intend to pay them back. At a Thursday hearing before a district judge in Manhattan, the 30-year-old pled guilty to one count of conspiracy to make unlawful political contributions and one count of conspiracy to operate an unlicensed money-transmitting business. After the hearing, Salem's lawyer said, quote, Ryan looks forward to putting this chapter behind him and moving forward with his life. As part of his plea deal, Salem agreed to forfeit more than $1.5 billion, though prosecutors agreed to accept a combination of cash and assets, including two Massachusetts properties, a Porsche, an interest in a company through which he reportedly owns a tavern. Salem was released on a $1 million bond and is scheduled to be sentenced in March next year. He is now the fourth former executive from Bankman Freed's companies to plead guilty. Bankman Freed is scheduled to stand trial next month on charges of stealing billions to plug losses at Alameda. The 31-year-old previously pleaded not guilty to fraud and conspiracy charges stemming from FTX's collapse in 2022. No. Vote no. Here in Brisbane, suspended Australian doctor William Bay is campaigning against an upcoming vote to recognize the country's first inhabitants. The referendum would also enshrine an indigenous advisory body in Australia's constitution. Bay is one of dozens of agitators who opposed Australia's COVID response, building big audiences online, and who have now set their sights on undermining the body, commonly known as the voice, according to analysis from independent fact-checkers. This voice will be giving representations, which is advice, to the parliament and to the executive. Thus, they will be the, become the most powerful body in Australia. Bay lost his medical license in 2022 after protesting against COVID-19 vaccines. In a speech posted on Facebook in August, he likened the proposal to bring the voice to Parliament to a 1933 German law that, quote, turned Hitler into the Führer. 
Many of the anti-voice campaigners claims bear little resemblance to the proposal Australians will vote on, which is to establish a body called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice to provide non-binding advice to lawmakers on matters concerning Indigenous Australians. Among the group's followers is Barbie Young, who believes the proposal is deceptive. Um, people will vote yes, thinking they're doing something for the Indigenous, where in fact they're taking away the, the rights of the Indigenous people. Polls show support for The Voice has already slumped from about two-thirds in April to less than 40 per cent this month. Analysts say the decline is partly coming from other factors, including lack of bipartisan support, uncertainty about The Voice's scope, and a lackluster yes campaign. But several experts also told Reuters the spread of falsehoods is playing an outsized role. We've been seeing so much misinformation and disinformation about The Voice on social media uh, to the extent where we think it's really polluting the discourse around it. Ed Coper, director of communications agency Populares, says part of the problem is that this is a whole new topic for people to think about. They're being asked to form their opinion. Now, how do people do that? They go online, they go to social media and say, what do my friends think? What do peers think? And that's the information that they're seeing that is false in many occasions. And that's been having a very negative impact on this debate. William Bay denies spreading misinformation, saying he considers his claims accurate. But the Yes campaign accuses the No Camp of spreading falsehoods on purpose as part of its strategy. Yes 23 spokesperson Jade Ritchie. When we talk about reconciliation, you know, to, to be recognised in the law, law book, the biggest book of this country is really important to us. And, um, and the voice to parliament itself is simply an advisory body. So, you know, to claim anything else or to be scared about it taking your backyard or whatever, an advisory body cannot do that. A spokesperson for Advance Australia, which is coordinating the No campaign, told Reuters that there were, quote, tens of thousands of hats and T-shirts out there and were not responsible for what people say while they're wearing them. The voice was proposed by Aboriginal leaders in 2017 as a step toward healing a national wound dating back to colonisation. Unlike Canada, the US and New Zealand, Australia has no treaty with its indigenous people, who make up about 3.2% of its population and lag behind in national averages on socio-economic measures.